Uh, buenos días, uh, bienvenidos. Uh, good morning. Welcome to our uh, uh, morning presentation, Engage Cornell, a new vision for public, en public engagement. This time we are going to uh, have a fantastic presen uh, presentation from uh, faculty and students who have been working at Auburn Correctional Facility uh, and, and with, with a group of uh, incarcerated uh, men who, um, in a way to help themselves, to transform themselves, to be you know, productive for their, own, for their own lives, they decided to put together a theater group, the, Ph the Phoenix Theater Group uh, at the Auburn Correctional Facility. <laughs> And they're going to tell, I mean, the students and Bruce are going to tell the story. Um, Leonardo Vargas Mendez, director of the Cornell Public Service Center. And uh, we do this kind of presentation throughout the year, actually. And so this is uh, one of um, many that we do. Um, and we do it under the umbrella of uh, Engage Cornell. And uh, Engage Cornell, uh, for this particular purpose, is just simply uh, collaboration between the Public Service Center and the Engaged Learning and Research, a new initiative that my friend Richard here will speak uh, a little bit uh, after me. The Public Service Center is the community outreach center uh, of Cornell University, uh, one, of, one of them. Uh, of course, we have a, a few others. And we engage students in co-curricular and curricular activities throughout the year. Uh, we organize and mobilize through our programming about 7,900 7, students a year, and we collaborate with about 100 and so faculty throughout the year. And they do it in a different, different roles and, you know, playing different, uh, uh, I guess, playing different roles for, for our students. Some of it is just simply being a faculty advi advisor for the student groups that we host at the center. Um, some is mentoring research and scholarship for students, and some other time just simply being a civic professional, lending expertise, their own expertise, to uh, communities and working in particular issues of public concern. And uh, the, this is one of the cases that we're going to be talking about. So uh, welcome again, and let's have a great presentation. Thanks, Leonardo. Uh, I'm Richard Kiley. I'm the director of Engaged Learning and Research, which uh, Leonardo mentioned is a new initiative at Cornell, started in October of 2011. And we uh, complement a lot of what the Public Service Center does as well as collaborate with them. We focus specifically on engagement that is curricular and research focused. Um, and uh, I'll be available after this wonderful presentation to answer some questions. I don't want to take away a lot of the time from the main presentation today, but I, I would say that. Uh, the documentary that you're going to see uh, today and the discussion that's uh, going to take place is um, part of a collaboration that the Public Service Center and Engage Learning and Research uh, were able to put together, and so it's really a pleasure to be here. So thank you. <laughs> so good morning. Uh, my name is Rebecca Stoltzfus. I'm a professor in nutrition and I'm also the Provost Fellow for Public Engagement, which is a new role. It's a new role for the university, and it's certainly a new role for me, and I'm learning a great deal by doing it. Um, if you haven't noticed or gotten the buzz so far, there are some new things happening in public engagement at, at Cornell, some, some new thinking, some new leadership, some new, some new structures, and um, some new collaborations. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be a part of that and to, um, to take some time this morning to begin to uh, engage you in that story. So as Provost Fellow for Public Engagement, I'm working half time on behalf of the Provost Office. And I see kind of two, two main thrusts of, of my work. And, and one is really the large, um, to create a large infrastructure or a large vision of public engagement, university-wide, that will um, 
connect to faculty activities, student activities, staff activities, and the communities with which the university interacts. And as you know, those are many, many communities from um, very local to, to very global. And within that large landscape, which includes research and outreach and um, education and service, to put a special focus on the student experience both in the curriculum and around the curriculum, co-curricular, curricular and co-curricular. And to do that, I'm working closely with these good colleagues, um, Leonardo and Richard, um, to, to really strengthen our attention and our resources and our rigor around that. Um, so our working definition of public engagement is to be a leading university where education research and partnerships act together to affect positive change in ourselves and the world. And an important, an, an important part of the evolution of that definition was that the object of this work is ourselves and the world. So it is not simply Cornell doing good things for the world, although we do do good things for the world. It's that in the process of engaging with the world, we also are, are learners. We learn and are transformed. Our education becomes stronger. Um, we become stronger as people, as professionals, and as democratic citizens. I got into this work several years ago um, when I worked with a group of faculty colleagues to start a new minor in global health, open to any student in any major. And one of the requirements of this, of this minor is that students spend eight weeks um, in a low-income community um, outside the U.S. borders to complete a global health field experience. So each summer, um, I'm responsible for the program that sends 50 or 60 students abroad for this kind of experiential learning. And one of the end results of this work is that for me as a teacher, I've gotten hooked on engaged learning. Uh, it's really transformed my view of myself as a teacher, um, my understanding of curriculum and what is curriculum, and my view of my students. So I just want to highlight, before you hear a very specific and exciting story, three aspects of engaged learning that keep me hooked. And I think uh, when, I, when I wrote these thoughts, it was not with the prison education program in mind. But if you hold them in mind as you watch and listen to this story, I think um, the connections are very real. So the first is the idea of community. So I believe that we human beings learn most deeply through human connections, in groups, on teams, in families, in communities. So an essential part of community-engaged learning is collaborative learning. So this is not learning that happens alone in a cubicle in the bowels of a library, although that kind of learning also has its place. Yes. You have to struggle for mastery and think independent thoughts, but you do that most deeply in collaboration with a faculty mentor, with fellow students, with community partners, with mentors. And this requires <coughs> listening, careful and honest conversation, grappling with multiple interests, talents, and viewpoints. So I'm a firm believer in group projects and group assignments because it's my experience that that's what our professional life consists of. I rarely do anything professionally all by myself. I do it in collaboration. So it's hard to evaluate individual contributions from group assignments, but that is my challenge. Um, and I don't want to shy away from, from that challenge. The second thing that um, I want to highlight for you is the aspect of diversity. So one of Cornell's values is thinking otherwise. And I think to have the capacity to think otherwise, you have to engage with others, and not only others like yourself. So be connected, yes, but not only to people who think and behave and experience the world as you do. Familiarity and homogeneity is comfortable, and we all need comfort from time to time. But too much comfort kills us. It kills us intellectually, and it kills us in other ways, too, I believe. One of my father's sayings when I was growing up was, 
Are you driving back the boundaries of your ignorance? <laughs> so this is true. So here's little Becky coming home from a day in the third grade. And he says, so Beck, have you driven back the boundaries of your ignorance? So I paraphrase that for my students to say, so are you driving back the boundaries of your comfort zone? Perhaps the best way to do this is to cultivate authentic relationships with people different from yourself. Cornell students like Henry David Thoreau want to live deep and suck all the marrow out of life. And challenging community engaged learning experiences give students that opportunity. The third thing I want to highlight is a sense of purpose and meaning. Human beings are meaning makers. We respond to meaning. Meaning gives us joy. Meaninglessness gives us the opposite of joy, which might be despair. Our students are asking the developmental question, what have I got and what do I want to do with it? Or in the words of the poet Mary Oliver, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? There is, of course, no single answer to this question. We all may answer it differently, and our answers will change throughout our own lifetimes. Engaged learning is necessarily problem-focused and action-oriented. It is learning in action with a purpose. The transmission and acquisition of knowledge is often viewed as the major endeavor of education. We teachers know things. We want our students to gain our knowledge. This is true. What is the best way for students to gain knowledge? Knowledge is now so abundant, so free, so accessible, that rarely does a student need me to get a fact. Community-engaged learning gives us an opportunity to synthesize and integrate what we know, to see our knowledge in action, to realize what we don't know, and to begin to move from knowledge to understanding. David Weinberger recently wrote an excellent book entitled Too Big to Know about the proliferation of knowledge and how it overwhelms us. And he cites a letter to the journal Science that was written by a physician in 1963, now 50 years ago, titled Chaos in the Brickyard. And here's a really great quote from, from his writing. This letter from the physician warned that the new generation of scientists were too busy churning out bricks, facts, without regard to how they go together. Brick making, Forcher feared had become an end in itself. And so it happened, he writes, that the land became flooded with bricks. It became difficult to find the proper bricks for a task because one had to hunt among so many. It became difficult to complete a useful edifice because as soon as the foundations were discernible, they were buried under an avalanche of random bricks. Our students, sometimes feel that we are hurling random bricks at them. Engaged learning allows students to pause from catching bricks and begin to build an edifice. They discover that they don't have all the right bricks and are motivated to go find them. They begin to move from knowledge to understanding. Community engaged learning is a learning triangle. It involves faculty, mentors, it involves students, it involves community partners, and in this case, the community partners are prisoners. But in that triangle, what I enjoy watching is who is learning, who is teaching, who is being transformed. And with that introduction, a very particular story. Over to you, Bruce. Hi, good morning. My name is Bruce Levitt. Um, first this morning, I want to uh, thank uh, Leonardo and Richard and their uh, centers for the support 
for the documentary uh, that we have been making at Auburn Maximum Security Prison. Um, the Phoenix Players Theater Group is an inmate-generated organization. And so our model of civic engagement is that we as facilitators, and there, there are four of us, um, myself, my retired colleague Steve Cole, my colleague Allison Van Dyke, and Judy Levitt. Yes, we are related by marriage. Um, and the model is that the prisoners are the experts. It's their organization. They know their environment far better than we do. And so we are there to facilitate what they want to achieve. The Phoenix Players Theater Group was started four years ago when two of the incarcerated persons, Michael Rines um, and Clifton Williams, who is no longer at Auburn, who was transferred, took an acting class, or just a regular introductory to acting class. It was offered by uh, Norm Johnson from Ithaca College and Carolyn Gelser from Cornell, who was one of our resident professional actors at the time. And the two of them decided that theater could be used as a method for transformation and redemption, that it had therapeutic value in and of itself. So they wrote a proposal to the administration, David Roth, who is the director of volunteer services. And David called Pete Weatherby, who many of you know, retired professor of English, who 17 years ago went to Auburn to teach literature as a volunteer. And from that, uh, Mary Katzenstein eventually got involved, and from that, the CPEP program, the Cornell Prison Education Program, was formed, which is uh, a program that is partially funded uh, by Doris Buffett's foundation, the Sunshine Ladies, and which just graduated its first class of 16 incarcerated persons with their associate's degree. Cornell offers the courses, faculty volunteer their time, graduate students get a stipend, um, and uh, then the Cornell gives the credit, transfers, transfers the credit to Cayuga Community College, which then grants the degree. We are not part formally of the CPEP program. There's another whole series of programs that are run by volunteers. And because this is an inmate generated group, there is no credit for it. There's no college credit. Um, so Pete contacted my retired colleague, Steve Cole. And Steve went up and interviewed with the two founders three times before they accepted him as their first facilitator. Steve worked with the group for a number of months in various acting exercises and in various physical representations of emotional inner life. And as one of the men, Kenny Brown, said at one point, in, not in, this, in the documentary, part of the documentary you'll see this morning, but later in the documentary, that he didn't know that there were different emotional ways of being, that he was angry all the time, and he didn't know that you could decide about your own emotional life. So um, Steve then at a certain point called me because the, the men wanted to perform. They wanted to invest what they had learned both about themselves and their skills in a performance. But they can't rehearse because they only can get together two hours and 10, 15 minutes on a Monday night. They can't get together and rehearse outside of that time because it is a maximum security prison. So it seemed the logical step was to do a, a performance uh, around solo performance, which I teach here at Cornell. So what we, what we did was to evolve a solo performance based on the autobiographies and the autobiographical stories of these men. And we worked on the stories, they told them, we wove them into a 90 minute script and we can't, we, the, the facility allowed us to invite 80 people from outside the facility to come and witness this performance. Their relatives could not come. A lot of, some of their teachers from the CPEP program came, other interested people came. After that performance, we spent time processing it and we asked the men what they wanted to do next and Michael Rines, who is one of the two founders of the group and a poet, the poem you have in your program, he wrote. He's nominated, uh, as a matter of fact, for an International Pen Award this year and he will find out in February whether he gets that or not. Um, Michael said, we need to do Shakespeare. We need to rub up against Shakespeare. And the responses were everything from Shakespeare's hard to who's Shakespeare. <laughs> These men are very smart. They are simply undereducated. So we took uh, a group of soliloquies. I took a packet 
and the men read them all and decided which one struck a chord with them. And we began working with those soliloquies. And the, as we settled on the one or two or three that each man was going to do, I asked the men to write reflective pieces, sort of impressionistic, not necessarily naturalistic, on their piece or somebody else's. And you will see the results of one of those in the documentary. And then when we did the solo performance piece, the, the facility allowed us to record, make a sort of um, archive recording, one camera at the back of the room with a microphone on it, which wasn't very satisfactory, but we do have the record. So I got brave and I wrote Dave Roth and I said, how about us doing a documentary on the group? And he called me, it had to go all the way to the commissioner of prisons, Brian Fisher, but he called me three weeks later and said, guess what? <laughs> I'm coming to Ithaca so we can discuss this documentary you're going to make. So then I needed a crew and I needed film partners. Uh, so Andy Watts, who teaches film production up at Ithaca College, joined me and he brought three of his students and I went to Marilyn Rivshin, our documentary, our film teacher who was teaching on doc documentary course, and she offered it to members of her class, and Jamie and Joey volunteered to do it. So it was five students, three cameras, about 20 sessions at Auburn. Now, Jamie and Joey had to turn in a 15-minute documentary for their final uh, in April, and we hadn't even finished shooting. So they had to find a way to tell a story in 15 minutes, which is a very long story and which in, our, in the documentary that Andy and I are editing will probably be anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours by the time we finish. Um, so they focus on two of the men in the, in, in the, uh, in the group. Uh, and I think I'll stop there and let Jamie and Joey talk about their experience and the way they arrived at the choices they made about the documentary you'll see in a few minutes. All right, thank you for the intro, Bruce. Uh, I'm Jamie. I'm a film and computer science double major senior. And as Bruce said, uh, Joey and I both became involved through production class we were taking in the spring. Um, and it was really early on in the class when Professor Rivshin announced to all of us that there would be this potential opportunity for a project at Auburn. And um, it was something that I jumped on immediately. and. I really think that there's this culture um, or this mentality in, in like, you know, the student sort of filmmaking community where we all sort of put uh, the cart before the, before the horse. Uh, maybe it's just me, but, you know, I came into Cornell really excited about the prospect of being able to make movies and I had a lot of enthusiasm and all of a sudden there's all this like great equipment and there's all these great classes and I was revved up and ready to go. The batteries were all charged and I realized I don't have a story. Like, I don't know what I want to say. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I think it is a creative roadblock that um, a lot of student filmmakers hit. Um, and so what this was, you know, this offers, like, well, here's a story, right? This sort of fascinating material right off the bat. Um, so it was, that, it was that interest as, like, a filmmaker that really um, sort of pulled me into, into the project. Um, but as it, as it sort of went on, it became... Uh, a much larger learning experience. It wasn't. It wasn't just about film. Um, I think uh, Rebecca framed it well in her message about uh, leaving the comfort comfort zone. Right. Um, we're sort of here at Cornell, and it's a it's a really diverse school and a di diverse place, but it is a bubble on top of the hill. You know, it's a big enough campus that you don't need to leave. You have everything that you could need. Um, so what this was is an experience to go into a different world to like get out of the bubble. And you're not just reading about it in textbooks. It's something that you, you get to live. And, um, you know, I really developed, like, relationships with all of these guys. It wasn't, they, they weren't just subjects, you know. Um, we had time before and after class to have conversations with them. And you got to know their personalities individually. Um, so I went from sort of having this orange jumpsuit idea of what an inmate is to having five unique examples of what inmates really are. Um, and it was, it was a great project to work on. It was a great um, experience in general. And the hardest part was 15 minutes is a long time, but we had, what, I don't know, 100 hours worth of footage. So it was, it was, it was isolating it down, you know, 
to find what story we wanted to tell because there's so many 15 minute stories that we could have pulled out of the experience. But um, in the end, we focused on two of the guys like Bruce said. And um, I think what sort of struck both of our attention was this idea of why these guys are here. And there are two of the five guys in the group claim that they're innocent for the crimes that they're in there for. Whereas another one in particular is very open about uh, trying to, you know, reclaim his identity after his crime. So it was this, this uh, back and forth between like innocence and guilt. And no matter what their, the reason was, they were pulled into this group and it was theater that was giving them the therapy to deal with their incarceration. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it to Joey for any more he wants to say about the film. But. Hi, I'm Joey Triska. Um, worked with Jamie on this documentary piece. Uh, when Professor Lovett first asked me to uh, ask the class to participate in the film and asked for volunteers, I was, I was a little bit hesitant. I wasn't really sure what, what to expect from this. I had heard from Professor Lovett that these were engaged men. They were motivated. They were driven. But you don't really know what to expect going into this. You know, you've got this drummed over the head idea of a prisoner from, from the media, from uh, stories you hear. Um, and you don't really know what an inmate is like, what, what is an incarcerated person, who is an incarcerated person. And so we, we sat down at, at uh, Professor Levitt's house and we discussed the project and we, we uh, uh, got prepared to go there. We got briefed on all, all, the, all the details, but we, again, we didn't really know who we were, who we were going to be engaging with. So when we, first, when we first got there, there's this moment where you, you walk through the prison yard and it's this transformative experience. When you, when you go into the prison, you go to the front of the prison and there's, uh, a, there's a large wall in the front of the prison and you, you go in and you're completely isolated. You're completely isolated. You go in, you have to get searched, you uh, walk through the prison and suddenly you're in the prison yard. There's nothing. There's just walls on either side and sky above you. And as you walk through, it's this awe-inspiring experience because you, this is like nothing you've ever experienced. You've been in dorm rooms, you've been in, uh, you've been in your hometown. I, I come from a town of 2,500 residents, so it's, it's not an experience that I've had before. And you go through and you end up in the school building and then you're back in second grade because all the desks and everything are the same as you've seen in, in school. So you're in this little bubble again. But for, for these men, it's, it's a bubble of safety and it's a bubble of education and transformation because they, again, for most of their day, they're, they're, they're in prison, they're incarcerated. But for those few hours, they have this time to work on themselves and work on dealing with their incarceration, as Jamie said. So when we first met them, I wasn't sure what to expect. But I was astounded by their reaction to us. They welcomed us into the group. At first, there was a little hesitation. There's always this, in documentary filmmaking, there's always this barrier between you and the, and the subject, so to speak. Again, using this terminology as subject because you've got this camera between yourself and the person you're speaking with. So there's always a little bit of a barrier there. But what they did is they, they came in to us. They came to us and really made an effort to break down that barrier. And so we all sat around and we discussed why we were here and uh, what our reactions were to this experience of coming in. And just talked about them. They told us their stories and we told, uh, we told them ours. And they gave us a little homework. They said, next time we want you to come in and we want you to tell us what, reflect on what, you're, what you thought when coming in here and how that has changed. And all I can say is that these are incredibly bright individuals who have an incredible potential. And uh, they did some incredible work that we'll see here in the documentary. Um, and it's absolutely nothing that you can get from reading about them, from even watching a documentary. But to meet these men and to know their stories and to hear what they have to say is 
an incredible experience that I, I can honestly say has transformed my view on, on not only prison and prison education, but um, life in general. So um, with that, I guess, hold on. Um, password. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> Here. Okay. Lights. Ah, really? Here we go. Hey. Okay. Here we go. A general, a, a, a general, general, general observation note. he wants to make. Yeah, I want to remind ourselves uh, of where we are and what we're doing here, because in the midst of all of this stuff that's driving Bruce crazy, and uh, uh, it's a it's a normal process for us in the theater, but not for y'all. How hard this is to get it all organized. Okay, and now we're going to pick up our ball game with an imaginary ball but we're going to add something to it. And that is, as you throw the ball to someone, say a word or a short phrase from one of your Shakespeare pieces. The main thing that I'm concerned with is that we don't forget who you are doing this. This is not about you doing Shakespeare. This is about Shakespeare doing you. I do refer me to the oracle. All the world's a stage. <laughs> I am thy father's spirit. <laughs> Women are warring angels. Oh. Apollo be my judge. My kingdom for a camera. <laughs> <laughs> we are a community of transformation. Through the power of self-discovery, we create the opportunity to know and grow into ourselves. One, two, three, P, P, T, T. Woo! Praising and talk about it. All right. Okay. So, do you want me to read, read a regular? Let's start, oh, let's start with Kenny's, because Kenny's got one before you. And, and, and remember, these conjunctions and. give you the, the new energy. And, and many, many man there is, even at this present time. Now while I speak, speak this, 
Hold this. I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. Yes, good. Okay. That was that that's exactly right. This confession dangles from the moments that ended a life. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It had the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. It's really hard to watch. Um, because I'm responsible for taking someone's life. I was talking to Alana for a minute about it, and um, it was really hard watching because uh, you realize that you're in a system that doesn't really let you grieve. <laughs> because when you're responsible for that, you lose your own value. As a person, you lose your own humanity. I need my things. It's over. You, you lied to me. I can't trust you. No, 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 you sick fuck. I'm a liar. Get in the car. I'm going to have you taken care of once and for all. No. Twenty-two Earth revelation, revolutions around the sun plus life for a conviction that rested solely on the testimony of a well-known liar in search of personal gains. Nothing linking this lost soul to the crime. Not a shred of evidence of any case. So they offered me five years, and, and the judge, I have it in the transcripts in black and white, the judge states, listen, let's give closure to this case, take five years. As a matter of fact, the district attorney offered you six to 12. I'm offering you, the courts, five years. Just to put closure to this. And I just, I was like, no, I, I didn't do this. I'm not taking this. So I want to add it to my script. You know, to my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'll look nicely. Yeah, this is a travesty, cried the singer. Order in the court, said the judge. Case adjourned until sentencing. Oh, but what form of prayer can serve my turn? May one be pardoned and still retain the offense. What then? What rest? We move to set aside the verdict. Denied. CPL 440. Denied. Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it? Well, what cannot repent? Line. Certificate of appealability. Filed and denied. Oh, wretched state, bosom black as death. Oh, limed soul that's struggling to be free, art more engaged. Line. Help, angels. Help, angels. Make a thing. Make right what is wrong. Bow stubborn knees. And heart with strings of become soft as sinews of okay, the newborn. Now. now it's gonna be okay. Babe. It's gonna be okay. That all may yeah. be well. And and just so we know that he ends in prayer, just do something. Yeah, there we go. All may be well. So there's there's just that moment of hope at the end. That that it may, you know, you may get past it.
Oh, chained soul, struggling to be free, bow and persist to trouble the dead heavens with cries. I really don't know what to do. I want so much to be able to, to be able to heal and to somehow bring light into the world after bringing so much darkness. It's been 17 years. A couple of announcements I, I hear that some of you already know. The performance has been moved to the 19th. We could rehearse this a thousand times, a thousand different ways, but not until we get on that stage is that we'll know exactly how nervous action is going to come out. Right. Right. So the, the really good news is that they're letting us rehearse in the chapel Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Oh, is that not cool? That's cool. The 16th, 17th, and 18th. Nice. So we'll have three rehearsals in the space in which we're performing. Okay, guys. You want to do a little opening? And then we'll, we'll get started. What time is it? Yeah, okay. 7.35, so maybe in five minutes, and then we'll go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to be with us this evening. And all of us who've been working with the Phoenix Players Theater Group, otherwise known as PPTG, are so happy and thrilled to be able to share this performance with you tonight. Thank you so much, and enjoy Maximum Will. to deal with our anger in different ways than just are burnt you know, and purged away burnt down to embers you've purged the way by those in high office with low ambitions for a crime which is not mine community is important the most important thing it's even more important than acting because if there's no support, there's no growth. You know, it has to be community, cohesiveness, you know, trust. Every day I look for a sign. I am enslaved and toil, a debt never to be repaid. Each day I awake in Sisyphus rock upward wall. What PPTG has shown me is that like all of us have diamonds. And all of us are also jewelers. We have our own two hands. We have a mind. We have a heart. We have two feet. And we're able to place that diamond in the most perfect way to release its incredible brilliance. What should one do while it closed the three walls of steel? As the sunlight flickers across the front gate, one is reminded that there's life beyond the wall.
Unfortunately, I missed that that performance. I'm, I couldn't. The day that it was finally done, I, I couldn't. I couldn't attend. Um, but definitely, it must be an, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful performance. And um, seeing this this, this particular uh, video, yes. Uh, well, it's, there's a lot of hope in it, I think. So anyway, uh, we uh, entertain questions for anyone who, firstly, I'd like to thank Bruce and the students for this uh, wonderful presentation. And, uh, and, and, and second, uh, anyone who like to ask any question to the member of the panel. Yes? I can ask, when we hear about engaged learning and research, and we have some examples of research that is taking place that we get a feel for what that means in the context of engaged learning. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I guess uh, you, know, you can kind of go by college, uh, college by college, but one, I think, uh, particular example that I'm um, really impressed with is uh, in the College of Engineering, there's a faculty member there who teaches a number of courses, has some labs, and works with a number of students to develop um, water filtration units uh, for communities in Honduras. And so right now they've developed a water filtration unit that doesn't use electricity. It goes, uh, relies on gravity. And they work with community members in Honduras and right now they're serving over 30,000 people with clean water based on the patents that they've developed to these water filtration units. So that's an example of engaged learning and research. Can I, can I respond to that too? Sure. Um, there's a wonderful organization called Imagining America which is uh, one of the co-heads, Scott Peters, is a former Cornell faculty member in the former Department of Education and uh, then was moved to horticulture and now he's at Syracuse running where Imagining America, which is a consortium of 90 colleges and universities. One of the founding members at the time was uh, the University of Iowa and David Scorton was at the White House when Imagining America was started. Um, it's the subtitle of Imagining America is uh, artists and scholars in public life. And Imagining America is trying to convince universities that doing the project is the research and is the publication, rather than us writing an article about this. This is the publication. This is the research. Uh, and that, uh, that kind of, um, uh, ex the kind of acceptance of that for promotion and tenure in universities would go a long way in cementing this kind of activity on university campuses. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Please. Yes, uh, this is very fascinating. So compliments to the students, the team who did this. Is there any other part of the university that would take the learnings from this and then engage with policy makers just to inform public policy on the issues of incarceration or punishment or redemption? I mean, the, the, the prison education program actually has a number of faculty involved. Uh, they, they teach uh, a series of courses uh, and, and in, in the teaching, as well as their own uh, work, uh, research work, they, they actually do that. They move from uh, simply the service provided to uh, the incarcerated men to uh, a more research and policy oriented, especially the students. I know the students are moving forward with uh, you know, th this kind of work. My question is, uh, is there this engagement from this learning with the policy maker? So, Public like policy. you have this going into the prisons, is there any sort of outreach from this learning into Albany or I don't know where this is done? Uh, I, I cannot answer yet, but please. So when I, um, when I began to learn about the prison education program, which I only knew superficially when I, when I took on this role, one of my questions for, for the leaders of the program is, is where, where is the discourse happening 
on the policy issues around this that for us as, as US citizens, this is, a major, this is a major issue for our society. And I know that I as a citizen would rather hide from this, this issue. But one of the things that, that this program can do for the Cornell community, and as you're pointing out more, more broadly, is bring the issue in, into focus for us. Um, I, I don't have the statistics at, at hand, but if, if I'm increasingly convinced that this is a major public policy issue with economic and social um, consequences for, for our society, and it's one that is largely hidden. So I think that one of my responses is that the potential for this program to engage the policy community is, is not yet fully realized. And one of the, the, the things that, that we need to do is, is connect these pieces of public engagement, like the prison education program, with the, the policy sciences at, at Cornell and, and some of those broader things. If we can weave these pieces of our public engagement together, they will be mutually reinforcing and, and be much more effective. So I appreciate your question. It's, it's one that we have to continue to grapple with. Um, just let me add to that, that um, the request to make this documentary went clear to Brian Fisher, who's the commissioner of prisons in New York State. Um, uh, Andy and I, who've been editing the, the longer film, we just finished uh, the editing the entire performance, the 15-minute performance, with the entire question and answer period afterwards. It's a, and it's a really gorgeous um, uh, video. And we have sent it now to uh, the, the, uh, the officials at Auburn, and they will share it with those people in Albany. I think this is a, my experience with the, with the system is that it's like any other bureaucracy, it's labyrinthian. And I think the way you change it is one person at a time and not trying to attack it frontally. I don't think you get. So when, when we started this program, uh, the, the latitude we have to work with these guys from the time we started three years ago to now is an enormous leap. And that's because we've gained their trust and they've seen the results of the program. And they just graduated their, as, as I said earlier, 16 men with their the CPEP program. And I think there are another 80 men in the program moving towards degree. And they have 250 or so requests to get into the program. And when we interviewed the uh, superintendent of Auburn, who is the supervising superintendent for what's called the Elmira Hub, seven prisons in, this, in central New York, um, uh, they are very, very very uh, interested in that program. As the superintendent said, a lot of the guys at Auburn are going to get out. They're not serving life. They're coming to a theater near you. <laughs> How do you want them to come? And the, the, uh, there's another program at Sing Sing with um, Hudson Link, which has a BA program, uh, which is also funded uh, by Doris Buffett. And they have graduated 51 men in that program who have since then been released. Wow. The recidivism rate in New York State overall is 61%. And it costs $50,000 a year to incarcerate a man and probably a woman in New York State. The recidivism rate of the people of 51 who have graduated with their BAs is zero. And that's not lost on the state. Yes. Are there any plans to, when the full video is completed, to give it a public airing? Is, it seems to be an actual for, for PBS, or, and that's another way to continue the dialogue and influence policy, right. obviously. Uh, I'm meeting with Andy this afternoon because we're furiously trying to make a grant deadline for Tribeca, which gives uh, anywhere from ten to $50,000 for post-production for um, uh, documentary films. As, as these guys know, there are various levels of that. You can do the sort of bicycle level where for seven to $10,000 where you edit it on your laptop and do all the color correction. Or you can rent a studio in New York and do it there on higher tech equipment. 
Um, and then there's the Cadillac where you hire an editor like Tom Swarthout, who's one of our own graduates, who lives here now because he can edit anywhere in the world because everything's on digital files. And he has children and he doesn't want to live in Los Angeles. He edited Sidney Lumet's last four films. And he's willing to advise us, but he said, if I touch the film, you have to pay me. And a good editor gets 3200 bucks a week. So, so depending on how much money we raise, it will make it more... Uh, viable for various broadcast mediums and once we get a rough cut we may take it to various places like HBO like Frontline etc and ask them what they want us to do with it and hope they'll fund the rest of it yes please what happens what do the men do when they're released from prison so that they don't go back to prison uh, they have trans they have they have transition programs and the the Department of Corrections name was recently changed to reflect a new philosophy. So it's now the department, it's D-O-C-C, -C, the Department of Corrections and Community Services. So they're trying to reflect the fact that they're trying to transition to supporting these men when they get out. Um, the, the more education they get, of course, in while they're incarcerated, the better off they are when they leave prison. The Hudson Link program at Sing Sing uh, they actually have a, uh, they actually fund a transitional, full transitional services for the men. And there are a number of organizations in New York City, like the Fortune Society, uh, which assist uh, in formerly incarcerated people in finding jobs, in job training. So there are a lot of uh, not-for-profits that are working in this area. And the state is trying to transition to that, to that in, the area, in, the, uh, in times of economic um, downturn. It's difficult to persuade people to spend money on um, on these men. Yes. Uh, just another route that I would uh, raise with you: uh, understand the uh, both the broadcast and the festival approach. But there are, um, you know, prisoner advocacy groups around who may themselves not be very powerful, but who undoubtedly are part of a network where they would find more uses for the film mm -hmm. to, to make it uh, effective with respect to uh, some ideas of prison reform. That, that obviously has to do with the final film, or even the final short right. part of it, but uh, lots of those groups which have their own agendas also have their own contacts. Right. and ways of spreading out uh, and finding uses that would uh, be effective. There is a, uh, a, a whole group of people associated with various universities who are members of Imagining America that have an advocacy network in which um, I participate. And uh, uh, in the Minneapolis conference a year ago, we had a meeting and um, talked about sharing resources and things like that. So that's certainly a viable option. Yes. Just a question about the making of the film itself. Um, one of the things in the introductory remarks, I think I heard someone say that the family was not, uh, they, could, they could participate in some respect. I couldn't remember what the testing was. I was just curious, was that because they couldn't, or there was a choice in terms of the filmmaking process, or why, why was that? Um, the families couldn't come to the performance. Uh, the, the, the access and restrictions on family are um, very carefully circumscribed uh, because um, contraband comes into the prison in two ways, and one is family. Um, the other is guards. Um, and so uh, they're very careful about the contact with families. They're even very restrictive on us. I cannot, none of us who are volunteering can write the men the men cannot write us. Kenny Brown, uh, who is the uh, man with the beard uh, in the film and whose voice you hear at the end of the film, was transferred to medium security. He's been in 23 years. His minimum is 25. There is no parole in New York State. You have to serve your minimum before you can be considered uh, for, for release. Um, and even though he's at another facility now, he can't communicate with us. We can't communicate with him. We are forbidden as volunteers to do so. Yes. Uh, do we have any idea of, of 
approximately what the percentage of our undergraduate students are that participate in some form of engaged learning, and then how does that compare with, say, our Ivy Plus peers? We, uh, the Through the Public Service Center program and on the survey learning courses, we have 7,900 students, undergraduate students involved in this, which is, uh, you know, uh, Two thirds of uh, you know of the undergrad population, and uh, you know there is always opportunities to uh, expand that. But of course, uh, we have to be a little more creative because we are in you know we we had a twenty thousand uh, student population over a thirty thousand small city, so oh. residents you know so uh, you know the our our activities need to. Uh, to expand to be more inclusive and perhaps uh, being able to support, uh, you know, student and faculty activities, not only throughout the state but nationally and now more, in, you know, uh, abroad as so well. Th that being the case, we, we could use some help, especially those of us that are CAN ambassadors meeting with high school students. I don't think. These, this type of engaged learning is really emphasized in any of our CAN material, and it strikes me this would be a great thing when we're doing high school fairs or our individual contact meetings with applicants um, to, have some, to have some more knowledge. So if you could help us with admissions, that would be wonderful. So I have recently been um, working with the data from the 2012 senior survey um, to try to get at this question. So if I define engaged learning as um, an international experience or a research experience or an internship or service learning, the overall participation rate in engaged learning of the 2012 Cornell seniors is 94%. Wow. In no college is it less than 90%. So the type varies around the colleges. So this was a really important exercise for me to figure out what, what the nature of the work was. Is the nature of the work getting students engaged? No, no. they're engaged. The nature of the work is the quality of those experiences and the linkage to the curriculum. And I think what you've observed here is exemplary. In all of the, it was, it was deep engagement. It was linked to the curriculum of filmmaking, and it was faculty, faculty mentored. So that triangle of learning was, was fully engaged. So our students are highly engaged. My, I think our primary work is to make sure that, that we are leveraging that engagement for education, for deep learning. Absolutely. Yes. Inside the curriculum and co-curriculum or outside, do students get credit for these four categories, or it's a case-to-case -case issue? The, the co-curricular meant to be non-credit most of the time. Okay, so but and and there is a large, as I say, a large percentage of the students who will do this without you know uh, without the compensation of of, of uh, through credit, but. Uh, Increasingly, though, uh, there, is, there is demand by the students to, uh, for this kind of experience to become part of their academic experience, and, and they, you know, they, they're learning from coming from the classroom and through, you know, uh, from the classroom to the community and to the community to back to the classroom again. So, and that's what you are actually, you know, meaning to do. So. Yes. issues and policy making. So this year we had a um, India and, and Israel, very two different models. But I was just curious because in all the public literature that I get from Cornell, they never mention this program. And I'm just, the gentleman on the, on the uh, three rows down, uh, up from the front mentioned that you know, as an ambassador. We don't get this information from anybody. So it's only the individual colleges 
because we are personally involved that we see it. How coordinated is this sort of the PR effort among the you know within the whole Cornell community? How how uh, integrated is this effort to get the word out that we have public learning service um, programs? Uh, you know from. Firstly, uh, we just launched, you know, Engage Learning and, and Research, uh, which is precisely, and, and through that, Engage Cornell, which is the umbrella category to sort of speak broadly about the many forms of uh, community engagement that uh, faculty and students do uh, here and everywhere. And, and so the, 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 the elevation from, let's say, from the hidden, you know, from the hidden life that occurs through this learning, you know, to become part of what is, you know, Cornell all about and how we actually portray that to the public is, is something that we are just starting to do and, and work through. We, uh, well, we, we are, what we are trying to do is simply uh, making sure that, that you know, our, all our, uh, you know, uh, new publications uh, are actually picking up, you know, the, the good work that is done by faculty and students when they are engaging, you know, themselves in, in communities and so forth. So we hope that eventually they will become part of the admissions publications and the stories that they, they want to tell about Cornell. Uh, you know, we have now a public engagement as one of the strategic, uh, strategic goals for the university, which means that we, we are sort of uh, invited to elevate our level of exposure on campus, you know, uh, around, around this particular form of education, which are at the very heart of what the land grant mission is and the kind of education that this university ought to impart to students. So, yes. um, <clears throat> I get. Maybe I could address that um, in specific ways. Uh, so when the Engage Learning and Research uh, initiative started in October 11, what we have been doing over the past, I would say, over eight months, I mean, first find space, get staff, and then meet with a variety of different people in each college to start to inventory what are the activities going on. And actually, I'm really pleased to say that ILR was probably the first college to step up and inventory all of their service learning courses. The dean actually um, asked one of the staff members to do that. So we provided a, a template for Kevin Harris, who works there, who put together a wonderful report on the activities that are happening in ILR. Of course, they're a smaller school, so it's a little bit easier to inventory. But what we're doing now is systematically going to each college and saying, have you done an inventory? What are the programs you're offering? And it's, it's different at each college. So if you go to, for example, Architecture, Art, and Planning, where I, I'm a faculty member, and teach service learning courses, you wouldn't necessarily know I do because they label them as special topics courses. And so unless somebody is systematically inventorying those courses, you won't even see it necessarily listed in a course catalog because it might respond to an emergent issue. Right? So, so for example, a course that, um, that I taught with another faculty member was to help design the recovery, recovery plan post-Katrina in New Orleans, which was a, a wonderful project uh, and entailed a significant amount of research. We looked at the physical and structural damage of 3,000 parcels in the Ninth Ward. We, over, we interviewed over 220 residents of the Ninth Ward, and we produced a plan that was substantial, and it was part of the official planning process. Um, so that's, so, but you wouldn't have known that that happened uh, because it was a special topics course that we were able to have a contract with New Orleans, and it, it emerged that way. So um, another activity that we're engaging in, as is, is, um, uh, Professor Stoltzfus mentioned, is um, we're We've now worked with institutional research to put questions in each of the surveys to get a sense of what happens when students come here and what are their aspirations and did they have a, a high school experience in this area, do they want to continue that, and then actually getting more specific questions so we can get good baseline data, which we don't have right now. And I guess the last thing I'll say is uh, Cornell was fortunate to get receive an optional community engagement classification from Carnegie. Carnegie has a new classification for community engaged institutions. And so we applied for that. And in the process, it was really the first time that we went out and tried to gather data on who's engaged in public engagement activities and what does it look like. And as you might imagine, it was incredibly diverse. So even finding 
standards or criteria. There aren't any consistencies across colleges. So we've made a lot of progress, I think, uh, over the last eight months, but um, we're continuing to get more information from colleges. So I applaud the efforts in ILR. I was really pleased, so now I can use that as an example um, of an inventory that was done. I have a question. Um, uh, 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 I want to ask for clarification. You here. The, the uh, water project in Honduras. It's called Agua Clara. Yes, the Agua Clara. Um, I think each plan takes about $100,000 to implement. I'm sorry, could you, could you say? I think it depends, but it's it's cost. Yes, it, it costs. How did you get the funders? I'm, I'm just curious about how you implement. Um, the the design. How do uh, for that particular project or for any of these well, projects? Well, uh, he applied for uh, several grants. Some of it uh, was, you know, coming from ELR. Some came from the public service center. Uh, he went for some grants outside of Cornell. He had a, I think, a National F Science Foundation small grant for a little while. And uh, I mean, uh, literally, uh, most of our faculty who are doing this kind of work, they have to do a lot of fundraising. And, and usually, uh, there is no, you know, the money might be available, but uh, it's, it, it takes a lot of time to go after those, you know, funds. Right. in the beginning right. was very instrumental right. with the funding. So right. there's also a great opportunity for alumni who get excited about these things to get engaged. Absolutely. And, yes. and, and they do have an standing collaboration uh, partnership with a non-governmental organization in, in, in Honduras. Uh, it's, it's a long time, you know, long term commitment to, to that particular uh, non-governmental organization. And I don't remember the name of it now, but uh, yeah, one of the things, I mean, you raise an important question, and I think you also affirm the sort of the bigger question is how are these programs and projects funded? Right. And it, it is much more costly to engage in engaged learning and research in terms of faculty time and the projects themselves. So part of the initiative around engaged learning and resources is to resource that effort more effectively. And so um, it depends. I don't know specifically how the faculty member, Monroe Weber Shirk, is one of the lead faculty members on that. Um, managed to parcel together a variety of different funding sources. But um, you know, some of it was funded by the college, some of it was funded with his partnership, some of it was funded by um, Engage Learning and Research and the Public Service Center. So he sort of compiled a number of different uh, funding sources to put that together. But it's always a, a challenge, and so part of our effort is to help resource these efforts more effectively. And it is the same case for this particular project. You can speak of, you know, that. Right. I mean, we literally, <laughs> you know, pull uh, pockets of money here and there and there, and, and then suddenly we have enough to do the bicycle kind of uh, <laughs> adventure, uh, you know, rather than the Cadillac one. And, you know, if, if we had the Cadillac kind of resource, you know, base, uh, imagine what we can do. I mean, you know, uh, so that is the kind of, uh, the, the, the kind of, I guess, obstacles that we are, you know, uh, we, we are facing, is that this kind of education doesn't have the support system, the resources, you know, that, that it ought to be, you know, ought to have. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a great question. Yes. We all like the film, but I'd ask Jamie and Joey, did Professor Rifkin? And how did you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think she liked the film pr fairly well, so I, I think it was a success in class as well as outside. Yeah, they're modest, they got A's. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's, uh, she's hard to please, but I think the fact that she didn't complain says something. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> there, were, there were very few words spoken after that. Yes. Um, this gentleman over here asked about family and how you were the families able to go to performance, yeah. and, and the family connection, I think, is something that is of great interest when you brought that up. 
I'm wondering if you want to say something about the DVDs that are going yeah, on. Yeah, the, the reason we did the DVDs of the performances first and edited them, and, and there's a question and answer period with the guys that's also about 50 minutes. So the, the whole DVD is 110 minutes. The reason we did that first is that the, the men wanted that to go to their families. So uh, we, cr we create and duplicate the DVDs, and then the men send the addresses that they wanted to go to to uh, a, an administrative assistant of ours in the Schwartz Center, who then mails them out because I can't communicate with them. So. One more question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. One last right, question. Last question yeah, thank you so much. I'm not sure of whether you, the purpose of the making of the film was engaging with the prisoners. What do you expect as a result of the making of this documentary? And has it changed the prison way of dealing with prisoners? I mean, what has been the effect of your film? What do you expect to happen when, you, when it's shown to the public? I'm not sure that I got that. So if you could explain that, I, I appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, the the fact that the that the system um, allowed us to move from one kind of public performance to another, the security involved in taking in a three camera shoot with all its equipment to the prison is something that they would rather say no to. You can imagine, we, they had to put, it cost them overtime every time we come in because there have to be two dedicated uh, corrections officers with us every time we come into the prison to shoot, to shoot the film to make sure the men do not touch the equipment. Um, so that in itself, just the fact that they let us make it after this group has been together for three years is an enormous transformation. David Roth, the volunteer services coordinator, when he called me, said he'd just fallen off his chair, that they gave us permission to do this. Um, I also think that the, that the impact, once people see the documentary, is hopefully in what one of the goals of the men, which we're trying to help them with, the reason they want to be witnessed is that they want to alter the stereotype of what an incarcerated person is. Not that there aren't people that belong in prison. Not that there aren't people that you would not want to run across in that prison. In fact, we just expanded the group and the men wrote a six page application. And the, the other people who wanted to apply for the group had to fill out that application. And uh, so the interesting thing is that one of the men wrote in his application how much he'd noticed a change in D, Diaz, the short, bald-headed man in the video, and how much easier he seemed to be inside the prison, and how much at peace he seemed to be with himself. And that's what drew him. He, sat, he grabbed Diaz in the yard one day and said, how come you've changed so much? And D told him, and he applied, and he's in the group now. He's been accepted in the group. And the older guys, the guys who've been there, the original guys, are now training the new guys. Um, so it's being passed on. The facility sees the effect on these men. The facility then reports that effect. As I said, the superintendent of Auburn is the superintendent for seven other prisons in the Elmira hub. And if he could, he would have a theater program in every one of those prisons. But there aren't universities and colleges nearby or people with the experience or training yet to run those programs. Um, they would love to expand the CPEP program to be a BA degree, a BA program, because they see the effects. Um, so I think there are a synerg synergistic relationship amongst a lot of the things that we're trying to do with this documentary, to have these men witnessed, to have people begin to question the, in, the system of incarceration. As, as Rebecca said, um, there's a private prison system in the country and they take transfers from states all over the country of the people who are in car they want the people who have the longest sentences because if they keep them incarcerated they make money if the population goes down they don't make money um, and there have been some insidious relationships between 
that have been documented between judges and private prison systems. So hopefully the documentary will, be, will help that conversation in the country about these men. There's a move now in New York State to reinstate parole. We hope that this documentary, when it's released, will accelerate the conversation about parole. Because there's, speaking personally, um, one or two of those men right now should be eligible for parole. Kenny should be eligible for parole. He's been in 23 years. Another two years isn't going to change. What, and, and I would have him in my home. Diaz, who talks about the fact that he was innocent, he was arrested 12 years after the crime on the, on the testimony of a man who was plea bargaining. And he wasn't accused of being present at the crime. He was accused of, being, of knowing who committed the crime. And he didn't. And all the appeals he talks about, he wrote himself in the law library at Auburn. And now the Innocence Project has contacted him. So, they're, they're, so that gives me some notion that there's some veracity to his story. So all of these are topics for conversation that we hope this film will provoke. Can you have a written thing about what you just said so the public understands what the purpose of the film is, uh, that you want to engage other institutions? You feel that, that New York State's the only state that doesn't have parole? Well, that's in the grant proposals, yes. That kind of thing is in the, in the film. No. Uh, I'm a storyteller. I'm in the theater. You know, no. I'll tell you why, Bill. Um, I believe in the power of stories, and I believe in the emotional and empathetic impact of performance. Um, uh, I believe that, the, that most of us are trained with a logical mathematical mind. That's basically the education we all received. Um, I also believe that Howard Gardner from Harvard, who has Project Zero, has written a book on different learning styles and the impact of different learning styles on different audiences. And I think it's essential that we tell stories of these people in different ways. And I think the impact of the film, the story of the 90 minutes once we tell it, will be clear uh, and will impact people and spur them to talk more than a sermon, on a written sermon in the film of what people should do. Speaking from personal experience, I've screened this film for a number of my friends, and it really does change the even this short form. It really has changed the tone uh, and the thoughts of of my friends about about prison and about what what prison prison is about and what corrections the system itself is about and and how these men are viewed. And I really think that uh, the longer form documentary will have that same impact. I mean, just seeing what's happened here with this 15 minute documentary. I wanna thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. <laughs>